Have you ever looked at a picture of yourself 10 years ago or five years ago or even three years ago and go, I can't even recognize myself, like an old driver's license photo? Have you seen those photos? And it's like, oh my God, <laughs> why did I look like this? I mean, or why did I sound like this? Or for me, um, it's when I listen to music that I used to listen to when I was a kid, I'm like, I can't believe I liked this garbage, you know? Right? You have those embarrassing songs that you used to like when you were a kid. You don't admit it now. I think the only band I listened to was Green Day when I was a kid. <laughs> and now I'm like, oof. <laughs> no, not just Green Day. <laughs> so the past you is unrecognizable in some sense. And I think that actually that means the future us is unrecognizable as well. We can change so much. You can do so much in a year or so much in the next phase of your life that you might not even recognize how your future got so far or how it got that good. I mean, I don't recognize myself at all. In fact, Luke, the video guy who took all this footage, I talked about him last week, right? About how he went to Orlando instead and then rented a car and then drove to Miami instead of here. Well, you know, the first thing he told me the day after the concert, we had breakfast. The first thing he told me was like, yeah, I have to say, I heard you were the pastor and I just couldn't believe it. It's like, it doesn't make sense. And then he said, uh, after the concert, he's like, oh, it, it makes more sense now. <laughs> he said more sense. He didn't say total sense, but it's okay. I know we have other friends, Dave Hunter and others that we could shout out to who are just like, I still don't believe it. doesn't matter. You can provide footage or whatever you want. I'm not going to believe it. So things happen in seasons. For a little while, you feel no progress. You, you feel nothing. And then that happens in a node or a season. Just things change rapidly and quickly, Right? That's going to be me in about a month when this baby is born. I will be unrecognizable to myself. Woof. Oh my God, I'm a responsible human being. I never wanted to be this. So it's a chance. New year, you can, you can actually declare it. Start planning on it that new things can happen. Um, there's a couple things that get in the way, though. There's things that get in the way. And um, I thought I would share a quick little story uh, from the New Testament that I have never really heard before. I never heard it in detail. I always hear about Moses and the big guys, and I never hear this particular story. And I came across it when I was Googling, what's the most important chapter of the Bible? That's interesting, right? That's a hard one. What's the most important book of the most important chapter? And I found a surprising answer relating kind of to this topic. The answer that many people argue for, it doesn't mean it's definitively true, but the most commonly cited was Acts 10. What happens in Acts 10? There's an amazing story that happens. It changed the world. Basically, Peter gets a dream. He gets a dream. When three people show up to your door tomorrow, you're gonna go with them. That's all, that was the dream. And he was praying on a rooftop, and he said that God said it to him three times while uh, hanging like this white, great sheet over him. At the same time, about 12 hours earlier, somebody else had a dream too. His name was Cornelius, and he was not Jewish. He was a good guy. They, they say that he was a, a man of good virtue. He was giving. He was a good person. His family was good. And he had a dream. Peter's in this one specific house right now. Go send your three servants. Go over there now and tell Peter to come to your house and listen to what Peter has to say. <laughs> that was the dream. So Cornelius sent the three servants. In the morning or around noon, Peter wakes up, having had his dream at the same, almost same time. Here comes the servants, and they say, Peter, you're coming with us, I guess. And uh, he said, well, you're right, because I had the dream too. So he goes, he goes to Cornelius, and Cornelius falls to his knees. He's like, you're the man that the angel told me about. <laughs> Peter says, no, 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 get up. I'm just a guy, just a dude. But he tells him the message of Jesus Christ. And instantly, Cornelius and his whole family convert and pledge their life to Jesus Christ. 
The reason this is important is because this was the first time that the gospel had ever been really shared to a non-Jewish person. This changed all of biblical history, Old Testament. It was understood. It was just understood that this was for the chosen people. This was for Israel, right? This was for Jewish people. And it's amazing. I never quite understood this context that Acts 10, this one story facilitated by simultaneous dreams going on was the floodgate that opened that actually Gentiles could receive Jesus as well. That changes everything. And it's amazing that that's cited even today as so important. What struck me amazingly though is that that was against Jewish law at the time. He even says it to Cornelius. You know, in Jewish law, this isn't really supposed to happen, but here's the word anyway. And what happens, Peter goes back to where he was staying, and there's other apostles there. And what do you think they said? They said, you can't do that. That doesn't count. (laughs) And then Peter had to re-preach all over again. He had to give another sermon to his own buddies, about, actually, yeah, I got a dream. I had it three times. So I guess then in those days, that was a big deal. If you got three times, it's, it's in. And then after I gave them the word, I think Cornelius was speaking in tongue or you know, showing all these crazy signs that were just too coincidental. And they said, okay, you're right. We accept it. And that was the beginning of the idea that the message of God could reach all people, all people. So here we are. I think this is such a great story now because we have a movement worldwide that wants to reach all 7.5 billion people. We are still continuing from that turn that happened right in Acts 10. And you know what's so funny? um, A friend of mine, I was talking to another worship pastor this last week about this story because I was like, man, isn't this crazy, this story? Uh, He has a Christian church up in Orlando. And he said, yeah, you know what I call him? Hometown haters. (laughs) So I'm going to borrow that today. There's these hometown haters that Peter had to deal with. And you know, no prophet is loved in his own city, as they say in the Bible. So your own hometown is actually kind of the least appreciative in some sense. And um, in a way, we have that in our own life, in our own minds. When we're trying to move forward and we're trying to break forward into something new, you're going to have hometown haters. I, I mean, I know I have hometown haters. My family's awesome, but I know I have college teachers and professors and neighbors from my childhood that would not understand what I'm doing now at all. They thought I was the cool rock and roll kid. That's it. Well, I'm giving myself too much credit. I wasn't that cool. <laughs> but they thought I was the little rock and roll garagey kid and they just would not understand what I'm doing now. Don't think they would even approve of it. You know? Now stick to music. That's your strong suit. Right? Of course, even in my mind, I have those thoughts too. So even in your mind, you have hometown haters. Even in your mind, you have, well, you shouldn't do that. You can't do that. It's never been like that before. You can't do that. That's not your strong suit. You can't do that. That's not what you have training in. You can't do that. That's, that's not economically reasonable. So you will have these kind of double work. You have to have the dream and you follow that, but you also have to release the hometown haters. And I think it's interesting, uh, Casey and I were talking about making our goals for 2019, but also it kind of came across to us to say, hey, how about we make a short discussion or something about the things that didn't go right in 2019, not with bitterness, but to say, okay, these projects didn't work and we can kind of post-mortem it, assess it and release it. You know, it's not impossible to just kind of change directions. It happens all the time, actually. So Peter changed direction from The word is for Jewish people to the word is for everybody. And I see that happening in my own life all the time. And the kind of sentence that flew into my mind this morning was, it doesn't matter what you think God said to you earlier. It matters what God says to you right now. 
because God is not going to do a one-time deal. Here's your mission in life. See you at the end of the road. God is with you every second of the way. What matters is what's God telling you right now. That matters the most. And I was thinking about it. God must be like this coach, right? And if you're coaching and, and guiding the world along, you might have to send in your kicker to throw a touchdown if the quarterback goes down or something. Things happen, and God is probably, and if, if we're here right now, we're kind of saying, hey, we want to hook into this great plan. Coach God is juggling everything. We don't know that bigger plan, but we do know that we can listen to what he's telling us to do right now. And it may be counterintuitive. You might have to be ready for that. So I was thinking about that, and it's kind of like this, I feel like it almost takes the pressure off. And as a millennial, I don't really call myself a millennial, but as a millennial type age, you grow up with this pressure that you're supposed to get the greatest job or the greatest degree so that you'll never have to suffer ever again because you'll never have to worry about anything. You'll, you'll be done once you pay your bills. You'll be done and free from stress. That's the goal of life. That's kind of the worldview that's pushed on us. You know, I think it takes a lot of the pressure off. I, I'd like to just share a little nugget from a teacher I had who says, you know, I don't worry so much about the notes I'm playing. I have one philosophy in music, and I feel like it's a philosophy you could make for in your entire life. I don't worry about if I'm playing the right note. I just have this mantra, I'm playing music to make others sound better. So if you're in a band or an ensemble, and it actually takes the pressure off quite a lot. Now you're not so like, oh, am I shining? Am I virtuosic enough? Are they liking me? Well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe I'm not the star here. Maybe I need to just worry about, can I support them? Make others sound better. And he went super spiritual with it. He said, uh, you know, he played trombone, so he's got this big instrument. And he's like, you know that flat part of the, the trombone at the top, at the mouthpiece, where it goes out like that? That's called the bell. So what he said is he wants to achieve front of the bell consciousness. <laughs> so instead of getting into my little detail of, oh, my mouth feels funny. Oh, I didn't drink enough water today. Oh, I don't feel right like I'm not playing well. He told me, you got to get your mind into the front of the bell. Am I making others sound better? Can I go a couple steps up and just look at the whole room? And I think that's a great example for what we can say about what are we doing for our families and for our community? What are we doing for God? It's not so much about whether I have all the status or I have all the, the, the markers in my life, but am I making the team win a little more? You know, that's that living for the sake of others kind of mentality painted a different way. You, you might find that, <laughs> you might find that if you're really listening to God right now, you're actually going to hear some things you don't want to hear. And it may be very counterintuitive. The Bible is so full of that. Paul used to murder Christians. And then he got a visit from Jesus. And then he became one of the biggest advocates ever for Christianity. So you might find that if you're listening to God's instructions right now, you might find a very counterintuitive voice coming your way. And you got to release and cut certain expectations from the past. Releasing the past, and I was thinking about that. You can't really release it, can you, until you're at peace with it. You have to be at peace with where you've been. Everything I've done up to this point has gotten me here. And there has to be some kind of button you can push that says, I'm at peace with that. It's okay. I'm here now. There's a releasing of the past that needs to happen if our goal is to create a new year and a new thing in the future. So you want to look into the past, not, the, ju not just the future, but looking into the past, not to dwell on it, not to become bitter or enclosed in your victim, you know, like, oh, my life's been so hard. You want to look at it so that you can release it. Thank God that we've made it this far. 
that I learned a lot from those things. And maybe you didn't learn anything from some of those things. It's still okay. It's still okay. It's time to look forward. I was thinking about this. God is perfectly okay with you releasing your past and changing your mind. God's going to support you. That's one of the forms of God's love. God is okay that you don't get a job in the degree that your, your parents paid for. God is okay that you change your mind here or move to another city. God is okay with that if you're doing it for the right reasons, right? God is okay with you changing course. He can work with you. And I have full confidence that this year is going to be amazing because I already don't recognize, <laughs> I mean, this room is so different than a year and a half ago, and I don't recognize myself a couple years ago. So I know that we're in a time where we're all going to change and rapidly push things forward. I don't recognize Suguru right now. <laughs> He's a little bit different today. And it's amazing. Things are moving. Things are moving. You can plan on things changing and moving. You can plan on it. You can bet on it. Why can you bet on it? Because God needs it to move and change. That's his plan. God is meant to succeed. Do you agree with that? God is meant to succeed. He's meant to it. He's committed to it. He's actually paid a huge price so far. Huge price watching a lot of humankind suffer for many, many thousands of years. He's committed, guys. He's meant to win. And so are you because we're, I could tell by the fact that you're here right now. If you're here saying, I want to be on God's team, you're meant to win. You're not meant to suffer needlessly. You are meant to succeed and become great. And I think we can start that this year. Amen? Aju? That's what's coming up. Things are moving faster and faster. Things are moving faster and faster. And I think I can basically see it when I look at you guys that we're meant to fill up with joy and we're meant to succeed rapidly. We're meant to succeed rapidly right now. God needs it and God is bent on it. He is committed to it. So you can trust in God in that sense. You're going to go places because God is going to have us go places carrying out his will. So that's the tone I think I'm committed to for this year. Um, we can always get better. There's always so much to work on. But I think together we're going to make an awesome, awesome team. As long as we're listening to the same coach, right? <laughs> going to listen and commit. So I want to wish you all a very, very happy new year. Please make it about serving others. Make it about succeeding. Make it about joy. Make it about God this year. And uh, we're going to do some awesome things together. Thank you very much.